giants. Are they just legends or were they real? Well, the Bible talks about entire tribes of giants. And today, we're going to learn where they came from and if there are any still left on Earth. And we're starting right now. Nearly every continent has legends of giants. Greek and Roman mythology mentioned Titans, Cyclops, and several other giants. Norse mythology contains stories of frost giants. African and Asian people also have legends of giants. So do Native Americans. And most people, even those who have never read the Bible, have at least heard about David and how he killed the giant Goliath. But hearing that Goliath was a giant makes some people wonder if the account was factual. Well, Goliath wasn't alone that day. There were actually a number of giants in the Bible. 2 Samuel 21, 15 through 22 and 1 Chronicles 20, 4 through 8 both tell us that there were other very tall warriors among the Philistines on the day that David fought Goliath. In addition to Goliath, there were Ishbi Banab, who was among the descendants of the giant, the weight of whose spear was 300 shekels of bronze in weight and girded with a new sword. And he intended to kill David, but Ashii, the son of Zeruah, helped him and struck the Philistine and killed him. Saph, who was among the descendants of the giant. 2 Samuel 21. There was a man of great stature who had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, 24 in number. And he also had been born to the giant, 2 Samuel 21, 20. And in 1 Chronicles 20, we learn that there was a fifth giant from Gath at the same time as Goliath. This makes David's choice of selecting five smooth stones from the brook a strategic decision. He took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag, which he had even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand as he approached the Philistine. So David likely chose five stones, not because he thought he'd miss his target, but because he might have needed to kill the remaining four giants after he killed Goliath. In each case, these giants from Gath are said to be descendants of the giant. The Hebrew word translated here as giant is Rapha. If Rapha is interpreted as a proper name of a giant from the recent past of the writer, then the four warriors were all brothers of Goliath. But the biblical text does not actually say this. It's also possible that Rapha was many generations removed from this generation of giants, perhaps he was the progenitor of the Raphaim, which was a clan of giants. And these giants in 2 Samuel were all just simply from that same clan, not necessarily brothers. The Raphaim are mentioned nearly 20 times in the Bible, most often in association with the conquest of the Promised Land when Moses encountered King Og of Bashan, whose bed measured 13 feet in length. We see this in Deuteronomy 2, 20, 3, Joshua 12, and 13. Moses and Joshua fought against these giants in the conquest of the land of Israel. Some of the Rephaim giants survived the wars, and their descendants settled in the Philistine city of Gath. The other warriors who accompanied Goliath then may not have been his brothers, as we said, but they were all part of a lineage that challenged Israel for their land and opposed God. Other clans of giants included the Anakim, who are descendants of the Nephilim mentioned in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and whom the people of Israel also encountered under Moses and later Joshua. We see that in Numbers 13 and Joshua 15. The land to the east of the Jordan River was heavily populated with other tall people known as the Emim and the Zuzim. The Amorites are another group that opposed Israel from conquering the Promised Land, and they are also described as being exceptionally tall. We see that in Amos 2. So the Bible is literally full of giants. 
It is really impossible to believe the Bible is factual and ignore these multiple references to giants. So, if we're going to understand who these giants were and where they came from, in this video, we're going to need to let scripture interpret scripture. If you're new here, this channel exists to help you locate those difficult to find passages and interpret them. If you like the idea of a channel like that, then feel free to subscribe and join us on that quest. Now it appears that normal sized human beings were constantly at war with the giants. In the 14th year, Cheddar Lamar and the kings that were with him came and attacked the Rephaim and Ashtaroth, Karniam, the Zuzim and Ham, the Emim in Shava Kirathayam, and the Horites in the mountain of Seir. And they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked the country of the Amalekites, as also the Amorites, who dwelt in Hazan Tamar. Now, Genesis 14 that we just read, with those difficult to pronounce names, does not reveal that the Rephaim, the Zuzim, the Emin, or the Amorites were giants. But as we had just saw earlier, they were. And in this case, Chedor Lamar and the kings that were with him weren't Hebrews, but rather they were Gentiles. So not only God's people were at war with these giants, but the Gentiles were as well. The Israelites, of course, also fought against the giants. Then we turned and went up the road to Bashan, and Og, king of Bashan, with all his people, came out to meet us at the battle of Edrai. For only Og, king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. Behold, his bedstead was an iron bedstead. It is in Rabbah of the sons of Ammon. Its length is nine cubits, and its width four cubits by ordinary cubit. The dimensions of this bed were an incredible 13 and a half feet long and six feet wide. Joshua fought several battles with the Anakim and the Amorites. Eventually, he cut off the Anakim from the mountains, from Hebron, from Debir, from Anab, and from the mountains of Judah, and from all the mountains of Israel. Joshua utterly destroyed them with their cities. None of the Anakim were left in the lands of the children of Israel. They remained only in Gaza, in Gath, in Ashad. So that explains why David later encountered giants from Gath. These were those that Joshua had not eliminated. Ancient Egyptian art is full of what appear to be giants. In the book of Chronicles, we learn of one of David's soldiers who defeated a large Egyptian man. And he killed an Egyptian, a man of great height, five cubits tall. In the Egyptian's hand, there was a spear like a weaver's beam. And he went down to him with a staff, wrestled the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. This man on the screen is seven and a half feet tall, same height as the Egyptian. But the Bible does not specify the identity of the man in the Bible as a giant. Why is that? While modern readers may think of a seven and a half foot man as a giant, like this guy, it is interesting that the Bible does not. Perhaps this is a clue that those who are identified as giants were actually quite a bit larger than this man on the screen. After these references to giants in the days of David and his armies, there are no more. The references end except for mentions by the prophets later of giants back in the days of David. So, where did these giants come from? The very first reference to giants in the Bible was at the time of Noah. Now it came about, when men began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Now Nephilim, or giants, were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. 
This is one of the most controversial passages in the whole Bible. But there isn't much doubt that the Nephilim were very tall. When Moses sent spies into the land of Israel after the Exodus, this is what they had to say. There we also saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So the Nephilim are also mentioned in Ezekiel 32, 27 as being terrors on the earth. So they weren't really very nice guys. Additionally, in several of the apocryphal books found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Giants, there are additional mentions about them in much more detail. Probably the most arresting fact of the Book of Enoch is the allusion to the sexual intermingling of human females with fallen angels. According to this book, the resultant offspring were giants who oppressed humanity and taught them to do evil. Because of the wickedness which had come upon mankind, God decided to bring about the flood. The Book of Giants expands this story and recounts the exploits of some of these giants. Now we have to remember that while the Book of Enoch contains some truth, as we learn in Jude 14, it is not the inspired inerrant word of God, and neither is the Book of Giants. For instance, the Book of Enoch implies that Enoch is the Messiah, not the Lord Jesus. So we should never base our beliefs exclusively or even primarily on extra biblical literature. These books are more like history books that explain the folklore and beliefs of the ancient Israelites. They add color to our understanding, but we shouldn't rely solely on them. So if we're going to understand giants, we need to examine and consider the giants strictly from the basis of scripture. Let's look at Genesis 6, 1 through 4 again. But Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. As we said, there is great debate about this passage. Were the sons of God angels? And if so, did they produce offspring who were giants? First, let's look at the term Nephilim. This word may come from the Hebrew word nephal, meaning fallen, or it may come from an Aramaic word, nephail, meaning giant. In the Greek Septuagint, Nephilim were always translated as giants in the Greek. So I think it should be in the Hebrew as well. The famous Mesopotamian hero, Galeshmith, was a nephail, or a giant. Next, let's look at the term sons of God. A very popular opinion is that the sons of God represented the descendants of Seth, whereas the daughters of men were the descendants of Cain. This is popular because the idea of angels and humans producing offspring is very upsetting and disgusting to most people. However, there is not a biblical basis for the sons of God being anything but divine beings. The term sons of God refers to angels or divine beings three times in the book of Job. Divine beings who existed prior to the creation of the earth. So scripture supports the idea that the phrase refers to inhabitants of heaven, either angels or some other hierarchy of divine being. Then there's that sticky question of whether or not the Nephilim were actually the offspring of such unnatural unions. Here's what the Bible says. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men of old, men of renown. Genesis 6-4 Now the wording of this passage is strange, and doesn't directly say they are offspring. It simply says they were on the earth at the same time as these unions, but it sure implies that the Nephilim were the offspring of these unions. I, for one, think they were, but the question it remains an open one. Another challenging question is if the flood of Noah wiped out all the Nephilim, then where did the Nephilim who show up after the flood come from? If the sons of God were fallen angels, and if these misbehaving angels were locked up in the abyss, as Jude 6 tells us they were, then how could they come back to visit the daughters of humans? Is it possible 
that some of the pre-flood Nephilim actually survived the flood? Lots of questions. The Apostle Peter explains that the angels were imprisoned in hell and that all the wicked were eliminated in the flood. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment and did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. So it doesn't look like survival of the flood was possible for the Nephilim. It must be something else that brought them back into the world. There are some theories that Ham's wife, one of those eight survivors, had some Nephilim genetics in her, and that is where the future genetics and generations of the giants came from. A second explanation for the post-flood Nephilim is that some other divine beings or sons of God, distinct from those who went into the daughters of humans before the flood, went to the daughters of humans born after the flood. Thus, the abyss would contain two sets of fallen angels, those who had violated human women before the flood and those who had violated human women after the flood. The violation of this command evidently would have produced a second generation of Nephilim, according to this theory. Either way, whether the genetics came from Ham's wife, whether there was a second violation, or whether God just created more Nephilim, the number of these future giants were wiped out by humans, the final group dying at the hands of David and his men. Another controversial question is whether or not the Nephilim are on the earth now or will reappear on the earth in the end times. When Jesus said his return would be like the days of Noah, many interpret this to mean that those days will include humans and angel hybrids. If you want to learn more about this theory and what the days of Noah means in context, we'll click right here to keep watching. I think you will find it fascinating what the term the days of Noah meant in the Bible. Till then, this is Nelson, and I'll see you there.